This is a short video on emergency phone calls to the police, uh, what we call here in the United States 911 calls, over in the UK 999 calls. Emergency calls or 911 calls are not a separate statement analysis science nor a, a particular um, change of study. Uh, they are, in fact, the very first interview, oftentimes with the subject who we later may call the suspect, making that call. We follow the same principles of statement analysis. We do not make any type of new changes. The, the context itself is something we often look for in the free editing process, um, where we label it a, a form of excited utterance, where the person has an emergency, the person must get to the information quickly, and the caller is either going to be working with dispatch to facilitate the flow of information or not. And that's going to matter. Two of the major principles that we use in analyzing emergency phone calls are the order of which someone speaks and what's called the linguistic disposition. What does the person think of the victim, the one that is in need of help via the language? And that's critical. Um, there's always a risk of oversimplification of 911 calls. Um, a checklist is useful perhaps in introductory work for statement analysis in general. It is not something departments should ever employ. A checklist can oversimplify and human nature has a way of making sure over time it will lead to failure. And so this requires some study and it requires application and practice. I do a lot of 911 calls and I find a generalization exists that uh, dispatch does a very good job. Uh, they can be enhanced by statement analysis training, yet they do a good job overall in gaining information. The best question to ask is, what is your emergency? Some departments will have to ask address first, but others, uh, depending on the system enhancement, will go right to what is your emergency. That shouldn't be changed. I had one recently where someone said, what is your exact emergency? And that's a mistake, not a, a tremendous mistake, but it is a mistake that can influence the response we want to be careful over. A number of years ago, I was teaching um, in a, a police department in the Southeast United States, where the group was a well-experienced, uh, intelligent, uh, well-heeled investigators with many years of experience. And it was a two-day training, and I thought day, day one had gone very well. On day two, the morning began, and upon coffee break, a cold case detective approached me and said, Hey, would you take a look at this transcript of the 911 call of a cold, or at that time, a closed case? And I said, Sure, I'll, I'll be glad to do it when I get back home to Maine. He said, Well, it's only about two minutes. I said, yeah, That'll be about six hours worth of work. He was insistent, he was persistent, and he had copies of the transcripts and a large case file. He was a dedicated professional. And he handed out the transcripts to everyone, and the hosting captain said, I think you should do it now. And I said, Captain, I, I have much material to cover, and um, this is something that I think would be better suited for a little more advanced work. And he persisted. But as there was a debate going on, I heard a squeaky voice in the background go, yeah, do it now. And that was my wife, Heather. I was nervous and I had an agenda planned and I wanted to stick to it. And I gave her a certain look that only husbands and wives can exchange to each other. We didn't need a single word to transpire between us. She knew what I meant. Yet she did not visibly back down. Why? She had seen the transcript. And so we did it in class, and at the end of it, the, the captain said, how sure are you? And I blurted out, in probably a little bit of excited nervousness, that I would stake my career on it, on the results. And the result was that the caller was the killer. The detective then said, couple things you should know. 
Number one, he passed his polygraph. And I have a great deal of respect for a polygraph. If a polygraph is administered in a subject's own language, where only he interprets his meaning, it's foolproof. And also the coroner and the DA were satisfied with the results. So this was going to be quite a challenge. They said, no, he told me what happened, and I believe him. This is literally the first interview that is conducted in a case. And there are a lot of cases, not a few, there are a lot of cases where um, the detective can begin with the 911 call and know what happened. And so I'm going to touch upon some of those, and then I'll, I'll get to the case here of what Heather saw. So what is your emergency is an open-ended question. The presumption of emergency is okay to use because they're calling 911. 911 is the police, it is law enforcement, it is the officials, it is the good guys. We go into this analysis of what is your emergency, knowing the context that it is an emergency, knowing that it should be excited utterance, and we use the presuppositional position of innocence and truthfulness. Uh, for those of you that are new within statement analysis, this is not a moral or ethical exercise. It's actually a, a technique to use to uh, discern deception. So we have an expectation. If there's a missing child, for example, we expect to hear, my daughter is missing. The first thing out of the mouth of a parent, my daughter is missing. This goes right to the physiological makeup of a mother or father. A mother or father has been created to sacrifice, to nurture, to provide, to protect, and a missing child is the utter element of impotency for that parent. They can't help. So a dad, for instance, has a little child, the, dad, the child falls, dad picks him up, puts a band-aid on, makes things better. The child's afraid of the dark. Mom goes in and comforts the child. Mom casts away the darkness. This goes on and on and on every day of their lives, and suddenly it's disrupted because they can't do anything. We then look at the order of which someone tells us the information. The first thing we expect in a missing child case, for example, is my son is missing, my daughter is missing. Here are a couple examples for you. Um, this is one that came in several cases where a caller said, we have a kidnapping. Not my son is missing in this particular case, but we have a kidnapping. And I believe them. I look at the pronoun we as a biological parent speaking for himself or herself. This goes against human nature. This goes against the uh, innate physiological creation within them of human nature that says, I must provide, I must pr protect, I must nourish, I must take care of my child. This is something that I immediately note it is not expected. Now, we might see something where uh, a husband or wife are speaking in the plural, standing together in front of a microphone. That may be. But we still expect the instinct, the parental instinct, the parental capacity to protect, to overrule all things. And pronouns are instinctive. And they have something. What is the concern there for the victim? There is none. The concern is actually for themselves. The burden is upon themselves. So this right away is a red flag of concern. We don't conclude deception or guilty knowledge on a single red flag. But one of the, the fallacies of using a checklist in that manner is the oversimplification. But I am concerned when it starts with what they have. Um, another one I did recently was, it began with this, we have a missing child. So I know two things. Number one, is the caller does not want to be alone. Actually, three things. And the, the second thing is, the caller has a situation of which he, in this case, he did not want to be alone. And the victim is not personal. It's a missing child. It's a missing child, not mine. And the child has no name. The child has no title which would connect to the caller who doesn't want to be alone. This is a very bad way to begin a call in terms of human instinct. So I have a red flag here. I believe them here that they have a situation. And then I have what we call psychological distancing language from the victim. This is our linguistic disposition. 
A linguistic disposition will reveal what someone thinks of another. Um, we looked at the Madeline McCann case quite a few times in analysis, and I believe the McCanns. I believe they hid Madeline's remains incredibly well, to use Kate's words, but the blaring issue for them in the, one of their earliest interviews and then subsequent interviews is they showed no concern for what Madeline was experiencing at the time of the interview. The linguistic disposition towards Madeline was what we call neutral, which in context of being missing is decidedly negative. Uh, that has led some people to conclude that Kate McCann is a sociopath, and I disagree. I think she's a caring mother who did stupid and foolish things, neglectful things, and then a major cover-up. But what she told us through that is that Madeline was beyond her help. Her maternal instincts were shut down. She had already begun the grieving process. She knew the child was dead. Um, we have a kidnapping. The Patsy Ramsey started her statement that way. We have a kidnapping. She, as a biological mother of a little girl, refused to be alone with what happened. And she, indeed, had something that she had to deal with. There was no disposition of care or empathy towards what John Bonet would be experiencing in the hands of a kidnapper. So we also look at the linguistic disposition towards the victim, but what about the killer or the kidnapper? Darlie Rudier from Texas made a 911 call that said someone had come into her house and stabbed her and the children. She concealed the identity of the killer. If we were analyzing it as an anonymous identification, we would note that her linguistic disposition towards the killer was positive. She liked the killer. She saw the killer in good light. We don't like to condemn ourselves. Darlie Rudier was the killer. Um, some of you may remember a number of years back the case of a little girl went missing down in Florida, Haley Cummings, where the babysitter girlfriend, later stepmother, made the phone call. And she made a phone call, which is very interesting, in that we note the priority. It's an emergency, there's a child missing. She began the call with the greeting hello, which is not expected. Um, as a matter of fact, it's a form of a, uh, what we call ingratiation. She is trying to make friends with police because she has a need to make friends with police. It's a signal of guilt, ingratiation. And she said, I just woke up, the door was open, and the child was missing. So we look at her priority. She doesn't tell a lie in that. There's no technical lie there. She wants us to believe the first thing out of her mouth is, don't blame me, I was asleep. The door was open, this was part of the staging that they did, and also insight into sexual abuse for another, another lesson. And the last thing of importance to her was the missing child. The child was beyond her help. So a couple examples for you. The one that got Heather in trouble, and later on much thanks for me after it worked out well, was she had read the following. It was a case where a middle-aged woman and her, I believe, seven-year-old son were found dead in what apparently was a murder-suicide, that the mother had killed her son and then killed herself. The boyfriend had come home and found them dead. And this is what he said. Two people just killed themselves in my house. So consider this. The story to be believed is that a mother shot her seven-year-old son, watched him die, and turned the gun on himself. And it happens. His linguistic disposition was to blame the child for murder. Two people just killed themselves in my house. Later on, I said the motive is right there as well. He's taking ownership of a house, whether it's his or not makes no difference. He's taking ownership in an emergency call to the police in which there are two dead loved ones, allegedly, in the house. They weren't loved ones. They were, to him, in this sense, depersonalized. The staircase with Michael Peterson. What's your emergency? My wife had an accident. 
The first thing he wants you to know is, whatever happened to her wasn't my fault. It wasn't intentional. It was an accident. He's establishing an alibi rather than saying, my wife fell down the stairs. And I believe his priority. I believe his priority is proving that it was an accident, that it was, un was unintentional. One of the most shocking cases I've ever covered in terms of a shooting was a former police chief, Will McCollum, from Georgia, New Year's Eve shooting of his wife a number of years ago. In the 911 call, as a professional, he was incapable of saying her name. Dispatch finally had to ask him, is the victim your wife? He was incapable of saying her name in the call as he limited the flow of information as severely as possible to conceal his guilt. We say in that he depersonalized the victim. His linguistic disposition was extreme in the negative towards his victim. We had a case a number of years ago here in the state of Maine where a baby was reported kidnapping, kidnapped, the baby Ayla case. And um, if you've seen any of the information on the blog or any of the videos, um, I assert that the father killed the child, and the child was a victim of ongoing, incessant, chronic abuse, emotional and physical abuse, by the father, Justin DiPietro. 911, what is your emergency? Ah, uh, I woke up this morning. My daughter is not here. So it begins with a pause. He needs to think. And then he gives me his priority. I woke up this morning. So whatever happened to her, don't blame me because I was asleep. And my daughter is not here was true. He had dumped the remains somewhere not too far from his home. Linguistic disposition towards the victim should always be a concern for what the victim is going through. Always. This is why the assistance that is sought is for the victim. An exception, we have a great exception on the blog of a, of a, um, a report where the caller asked for help. The caller was a registered nurse applying CPR, applying first aid. She wanted more guidance. Generally speaking, we look for the caller to tell us the victim needs help. One of the ones to take a look at is uh, another interesting case of Isabel Chellis, of which a, um, a sex offender is currently under arrest, and this is a great one to study. I want to report, the father said, a missing person. So we have initially distancing language, and then we have not, my daughter isn't here. My daughter's missing, I can't find my daughter. We have A, among others, Missing person. A missing person. This is a psychological distancing from the child by a biological father, and uh, much review of that case shows, you know what? There's guilty knowledge within that caller in the Isabel Chellis case. So emergency calls are interviews. They are the first interviews. They are first contact. The, uh, the best in dispatch can do is to ask open-ended questions. Be very careful not to lead the subject. Don't teach the subject how to lie. By asking what is your emergency, always note the first thing that comes out of the mouth of the caller is going to be a priority. The very first thing. And in this interview, as it unfolds, many detectives are able to, to save lots of hours of time and focus directly in upon the subject. 